Hello, everyone. Uh, good to see you again. Well, I can see you. You can see me. Um, it's been a little while since we've had a, a seminar, so welcome to the Waterloo AI uh, seminar series. Um, today, we're very happy to have uh, Dr. Thomas Dietrich from Oregon State University, who's going to be talking to us. Um, I just want to give a little overview of things that are going on uh, locally uh, with the Institute, and then uh, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Dietrich and the talk. Um, it seems like we have a bunch of events stacked up recently, so um, things are getting you know more open in the region, and people are able to go out to shop in restaurants with lots of caution and masks and protections, but um, the Institute is also opening. Um, not in person, everything's still virtual, but um, if you take a look at uh, waterloo.ai uh, and go to the Institute uh, website, you'll see that there's a, a bunch of talks scheduled for the over the next month, actually, um, from industry and academia. So there's going to be a bunch of interesting uh, different talks. And in, um, in a few weeks, on March 25th, is in industry event uh, in coordination with the AMC, um, which you can register for and join. It's an all-day event. Um, so take a look at Waterloo AI for more things that are happening and uh, connect with the, uh, with the Institute. Um, so today uh, our speaker is Thomas Dietrich. Um, I have the full bio. He's a distinguished professor emeritus of the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Oregon State University. Um, I did my postdoc with him there um, before I came here, so it was a fantastic uh, machine learning group and lots of interesting things happening in Oregon State. And um, Professor Dietrich really is one of the pioneers of machine learning. Um, he has uh, hundreds of publications with thousands of citations and a number of books. Um, his focus on his research is in artificial intelligence, um, robust human AI systems, and applications in sustainability. Um, he was former president of the AAAI um, organization um, and a founding member of the International Machine Learning Society. Um, he was also um, co-founder of the Journal of Machine Learning Research, so you can thank him for that. Um, so um, without further ado, I'm going to let uh, Tom give his talk. and. As things work out, there's a live Q&A um, form on the side of your view, so you can post your questions there, I'll be able to see them. And if there's space in the middle of the talk, we can uh, give them to Tom to ask, and definitely at the end, there'll be a question A. So hopefully uh, you can get that working. So Tom, over to you. Okay, let's see if we can make this work. All right, well, uh, it's exciting to, to have the chance to, to visit Waterloo. Uh, I'm really sorry I can't be there in person, but uh, I'll, I'll uh, hope to, to do that at some future date. Um, and I'm excited to talk about this work. This is the very first time I've, I've spoken on this work, uh, so um, uh, it's uh, very, very recent. Uh, it's joint with Jesse Hostetler, who works for SRI International and is a former PhD student from our department. Uh, who worked with uh, Alan Fern and me. Um, and what we're working on is trying to provide what we call prospective guarantees on the performance of policies in Markov decision processes. Uh, actually, it uh, probably doesn't have to be an MDP. But uh, um, so the scenario we're interested in is a human decision maker who has an AI assistant and uh, needs to decide whether to uh, to press go on that assistant. So the idea is that the world is as uh, is in some state S not, and uh, uh, and and the, the this is my my AI assistant and this is me. And so I want to ask the assistant. Well, given that we're starting in state S not, how are you going to behave? What what will what you know? For example, what's the probability that you'll succeed at uh, at achieving the goal, or what will what will the profile of your behavior be over time? And what the agent is supposed to give back to me is what we call a trajectory-wise confidence interval. Um, and this is uh, intended to be a little schematic. We'll see more of these in more detail later. But the horizontal axis is the time steps, and the vertical axis is, is, uh, is in this case, the cumulative reward along the trajectory. So in, and in this problem, it's actually a cumulative cost, so, or, or the reward is negative. So um, it could be as bad as this low bound here or, or as good as this upper bound. And what the uh, guarantee is, is that with probability one minus delta, the actual performance will be inside that bound. And then if I like the looks of that, then I can go ahead and press the go button 
and the agent will go off and do this, say, eight steps of, of execution. So that's the kind of scenario we're in. And, uh, and I'll talk later about two examples, um, one involving uh, uh, the management of invasive species, uh, the tamarisk uh, tree that's invading the river networks of the uh, southwestern United States, and the other uh, uh, ga uh, simple games in, in StarCraft. So the, uh, the summary of the approach, the, what we're going to do is we rely on the ability to, to, to build a training set of trajectories through the problem for a variety of starting states. So we imagine that we can repeat uh, end times where we sample a, a starting state from some starting state distribution, P naught, and then we execute this policy pi for H steps and we get a trajectory. And here I plotted, I think 500 trajectories um, starting at different starting states. And then we're going to apply our new technique that we'll describe here, which is a combination of two sub techniques, I guess. One is that we'll perform what's called quantile regression. Um, and I'll explain what that is later to estimate the uh, lower and upper, uh, you know, we'll say delta over two uh, uh, quantiles of this distribution. And then, uh, and those are actually conditioned on whatever the starting state was. So it's a kind of like a generalization of regression to predict the, the quantiles. Uh, and then we're going to adjust those to obtain valid confidence intervals. That validate should have been valid. Uh, valid confidence intervals using a new method that I'll describe called the scaled standard deviation trajectories. So, um, so this is what uh, uh, the the uh, uh, for a particular starting state, the true uh, trajectory is in red, but those sort of gray um, lines above and below it would be the results of the quantile regression. Uh, but quantile regression doesn't give us a probabilistic guarantee of any kind. And so then we're going to adjust those and we'll get something that looks more like these green bounds that uh, that do give us a guarantee. So the outline is I'll first talk about, uh, uh, give some background on uh, what are called conformal confidence intervals, and then present the, the core uh, problem, which is just how can we get multivariate confidence intervals? Um, and then we'll talk about, uh, finally, about confidence intervals for these trajectories, uh, present some experimental results, and then close with, with an assessment of the, of the general approach. So the background uh, really uh, goes back to the work of, of Vladimir Volf and his colleagues, uh, Gammerman and Schaefer. Uh, and in 2005, I mean, he'd been working on this for several years before, but in 2005, they published a, an important book um, in which they introduced this uh, conformal prediction methodology. And I'll give a very simple version of it here, which is that uh, let's assume that, we're, we, that we can draw data points. These would just be data points on the real line um, uh, from some uh, unknown probability distribution, but these are e exchangeable draws. So that is to say that the order doesn't matter, um, uh, uh, but they could be conditioned on something else, but the, but the order doesn't matter. And then uh, we'll define the first n of these n plus one points as our training data. And then the n plus first point is going to be essentially our test query. Uh, and what we want to determine is we want to find an upper bound. I'll just think about an upper confidence bound here, um, which I'll call high of s, um, such that the probability uh, when we take a new draw from this distribution, the pro that that, uh, that that point that new value will be less than or equal to this upper bound with probability at least one minus delta, and of course we'd like that upper bound to be as tight as possible. Um, we could set it equal to infinity and trivially satisfy this, but but we want a tight upper bound. And so um, the basic method is uh, that we take our training data and we sort it into ascending order to get its order statistics, right? So this is the smallest value, the largest value, and everything in between. And then we're just going to return uh, this uh, element of the list, which is one minus delta times n plus one, which is the number of data points here, plus the one that, we'll, that, that represents the query point. And so this is a, a sort of a adjusted one minus delta quantile of this distribution. Um, and uh, uh, and what's surprising is that we can get a finite sample guarantee uh, in general for arbitrary distributions 
with this uh, with this approach, and and that's the insight. And to give you a sort of informal version of the proof, um, imagine for a moment that we had computed the order statistics for all n plus one data points that had come in, and now we ask ourselves uh, for this new data point, the x n plus first one, which is not necessarily this one, right? This is the largest, but this is our query point. Uh, its rank within these n plus one numbers is going to be uniformly distributed. Uh, and that's a consequence of the exchangeability of these data points, that their, their order is, in, un, is uh, irrelevant. And so um, it, it could, the order of arrival is irrelevant, but that turns into the fact that uh, they, 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 they all share this same distribution. And so, um, so we can therefore choose a threshold among these n plus one points that captures uh, one minus delta of the probability. And so that one minus delta quantile will be in this case, um, this number here, uh, right? Drawing out of these n plus one points, we just take sort of one minus delta times the n plus first point, and then take the ceiling of that to round it up. And so then we can, uh, because of the, the uniform distribution within these ranks, the probability that the n plus first point will be less than or equal to this quantile will be uh, greater than or equal to one minus delta. But of course, um, we really have to choose a bound using only the first n points. We, we don't know what that n plus first point will be. But it turns out uh, that we can do a simple adjustment multiplying 1 minus delta by n plus 1 divided by n, which slightly expands the quantile that we're looking at. And it turns out that in a rank list of n points, that will still be this, this element of, of, the, of the first n. Uh, and this will work as long as delta is not too small. Um, uh, if delta gets too small, then this actually pops off the end of the list and there is no uh, point that, that satisfies this, this condition. So in this case, uh, what I did was I drew 100 points from a student T distribution with one degree of freedom. So it has a very heavy tails uh, just to kind of illustrate. And the method uh, chooses this point here as the, as the, uh, to give us this, this threshold. Um, so uh, it's kind of surprising that this idea ha ha sort of eluded uh, all of the great statisticians until <laughs> until uh, the 21st century uh, because it is such a simple idea. Okay, well now with this concept in hand, let's move on and talk about how we could turn this into a multivariate confidence interval. Um, so in a multivariate confidence interval, right, we have data that now belong, say, in d-dimensional real space. And we want to get a box, um, which I'll represent as a, a lower bound vector and an upper bound vector, such that with probability, uh, we're sampling an n plus first vector from P, um, it will be contained inside that box with probability of at least one minus delta. Uh, and we're going to assume that we are that we have essentially two data sets here. We have one data set D1 that has m little m points in it, and a second data set that has m plus one up to n. So the total number of points is n. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is known in the conformal literature as split conformal prediction. We're going to use D1 to do to make some initial uh, estimate one uh, a set of initial parameters, and then D2 to get ourselves the exchangeable. Uh, values for for the uh, uh, the conformal co correction. So when you when you think about these d-dimensional points, um, it's often uh, the sort of standard mindset is well, I need to learn a separate confidence interval along each of the d-dimensions. So I'll need d confidence intervals, and then I need them to all hold simultaneously. And that uh, generally leads you down the path of thinking, oh well, then I'm going to need what's called a Bonferroni correction. Right, I'll basically have to divide delta by D um, and get a much more stringent confidence interval for each individual one. Um, and this uh, leads to very uh, weak confidence intervals, very wide ones, because it's unable to take advantage of any of the correlations that might exist among the different dimensions. It assumes it's equivalent to a union bound. It's assuming that uh, all the dimensions are really independent of each other. So the trick to applying conformal methods is to somehow convert this d-dimensional problem into a one-dimensional parameter problem, and then we can use the conformal trick. So the basic idea is, is again, very simple. We're going to, from data set D1, 
we're going to estimate the mean along each dimension j. So I'll use j to index from one up to little d, the dimensions. And uh, we'll estimate the mean and the standard deviation uh, along each dimension separately. And then the proposed confidence interval is going to have the very unsurprising form of mu hat plus or minus uh, some uh, magic parameter beta times uh, sigma hat j. So beta is going to be our one dimensional parameter. And so this allows us to, to uh, adjust the sort of the, the, the um, extent of each confidence interval um, according to how much variability there is along each dimension while still having just a single global uh, parameter that we need to, whose value we need to determine, which is beta. So um, the basic idea is to start with our original data points here and estimate say um, mu, which is this box, and then the two sigma hats, which are these two arrows. And then we're going to use that to rescale our data, right? So that this should be exactly square. Doesn't really look like it to me, but imagine this is square now, right? Um, and what we do is if, uh, if sigma hat is zero along some dimension, then that dimension of the box would actually be zero. Uh, but otherwise, we're just uh, subtracting off the mean and dividing by the standard deviation and taking the uh, absolute value we'll see in a moment. Um, so, so these are what the scaled points look like. And then what we want to do is uh, for each of these data points, each data point I, we want to ask, well, uh, say this, this data point here, uh, along which dimension is it farther away from the, the, the center? And of course, in this case, for that point, it's the X, uh, the first dimension that is bigger than the second dimension, right? But of course, for uh, a point like, uh, I, I don't know, maybe this one here, the vertical axis would be the more important, uh, the maximum dimension. And the idea is that since we're going, our confidence interval is going to look like a square box here, uh, um, the dimension along which a point will be excluded from the box um, will be the larger of the of its dimensions. So let CI be the maximum over all the different dimensions of these standardized uh, coordinates of the of the data. So what's the widest dimension of the standardized point XI? And then we're going to sort them uh, to get their order statistics and then uh, calculate this uh, conformal uh, correction. So, so here's a uh, 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 they're, they're sorted points, and the uh, and this beta turns out to be the correspond to this point that's indexed as number one, um, uh, which was actually this point here. Um, and then based on that, we can go back to our original data set and and we get this as the uh, confidence interval. So we're excluding these three points, but the rest of the points are are inside the box. So that's that's uh, sort of visually how the method works. Um, and maybe I should pause here and, and see if there are any questions. There was a question. Um, somebody asked actually, um, how do you generate the trajectories? Do you assume access to a simulator? Uh, yes, so we're going to assume we have access to a simulator or that we can uh, get, if it was say a robot in the real world that we could get actual trajectories. Um, and and not surprisingly, you know, you need to be able to get a decent estimate of this quantile. Um, and uh, so you need uh, a fair number of trajectories. We can look at that as we go on for in the, in the talk. Great, okay. All right, so we can prove a theorem then that uh, that that this is a valid confidence interval um, uh, uh, using the basically the the pattern of the conformal proof. Um, so it's interesting uh, after after we come up with this algorithm, we realized uh, that then in the case when the unknown distribution is a multivariate Gaussian distribution, we can prove that it is the optimal confidence interval. Um, so if you think about multivariate uh, Gaussian distributions, right, they look like uh, they sort of have an ellipsoidal shape, right, if the, the, that's determined by the structure of the covariance matrix. Mm -hmm. uh, and it turns out that uh, um, for, if we just think about uh, the optimal confidence interval for, uh, for any distribution, one definition of what means to be an optimal confidence interval is that it consists, that it comprises a minimum volume set. So, you have some uh, 
a uh, space of possible sets that you're considering and you want the one that has the smallest volume, say as measured in, in, in uh, the Lebesgue measure, so literally the volume, um, that contains one minus delta of the probability of that distribution. Now for Gaussians, the minimum volume sets are always ellipsoidal uh, structures, right, with some radius, and we can write them as the Mahalanobis distance, if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is basically the exponent of the of the uh, you know in the Gaussian density, and uh, we just want all the points that are less than or equal to that should be less than or equal to r squared. But uh, but in our case, we're not interested in ellipsoidal intervals. We want axis parallel intervals. But uh, it's a fairly straightforward argument to show that the minimum volume axis parallel hyperrectangle will actually exactly circumscribe an ellipsoid that looks like this. Mm -hmm. And so then you can project the dimensions of that uh, hyperrectangle onto the coordinate axes, and it turns out they have this uh, this exactly this structure. Mm. Um, but of course, the the method works for uh, for arbitrary distributions. But uh, but it was nice that this is I guess uh, what Leo Breiman would have called the comfort theorem. It says we're on the right track. Uh, right. So. Um, uh, so now let's uh, turn to the to our actual getting uh, uh, confidence intervals on trajectories out of Markov decision processes. Um, so we're, we're going to assume we have a discrete time, but possibly continuous state continuous action MDP. And it has some starting state distribution P naught and with it, we have some fixed policy that we would execute in this MDP. And we're interested in just uh, H, H, uh, trajectories of length uh, little h, um, which in the two problems I'm talking about, we are 50 and 57 steps. Um, and so to generate one of those trajectories, we want to sample a starting state from the starting state distribution, then execute the policy pi for h steps. And then we're going to collect up uh, the states, the actions, the rewards along that trajectory. And now we want to give a perspective confidence interval about what? Well, about the behavior. And, and so in general, we want to define a behavior function that is a function of the trajectory and also the time step. And use that to summarize the behavior of the policy at time t. And so here we could, we could have choose many different things. We could be looking at some state variable. Um, we could be looking at just the immediate reward at each time step. I'll be using the cumulative reward, so the sum of rewards up to time t. Uh, we could also be looking at the reward to go until we get to the end of the trajectory. But whatever whatever we choose as our behavior function, um, we'll denote that by uh, b of tau is the behavior vector or trajectory for that particular tra underlying trajectory tau. So it'll be b of tau at time one, all the way up to b of tau at time h. <clears throat> and so then, by prospective confidence interval, what we mean is that, that using only the starting state, uh, we're going to predict uh, a, a uh, lower bound and upper bound vector such that the behavior, the true behavior vector will be inside those bounds with probability one minus delta. So um, the, the next topic we need to, to remind ourselves about is quantile regression, okay? Um, because a big, big challenge here really is to make this depend on the starting state. We could, if we just had uh, collected 100 trajectories or whatever, or, or 500 as I showed in my first slide, we could give a confidence interval over all of that, but that would be, uh, that would apply regardless of the starting state. Right? It wouldn't depend on the starting state at all. Uh, and, uh, and so it wouldn't be very interesting from the point of view of, uh, of, a, of me deciding whether to press go on my robot. I want to know whether it's good in this starting state and whether I can trust it in this starting state. And we're going to see that the answer I give you doesn't quite tell you that. Um, uh, and so we'll come back to the, the answer that I'm going to give is actually what I call semi-conditional. It is customized for the individual starting states, um, but the, uh, but the um, probabilistic guarantee actually still only applies globally over the entire starting state distribution. So, um, so to make the, 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 this perspective confidence interval depend on the starting state, we're going to use quantile regression. So what is quantile regression? Well, um, uh, you know, in a standard regression problem, you're assuming that you're working with a conditional probability 
uh, P of Y given X, where X is the input features and Y is the response, right? And, uh, and in linear regression, we assume that our goal is to estimate the mean of this as a function of X, right? So, so we, the, our regression function predicts the expected value of Y conditioned on X. Um, uh, but of course, um, that's not always what we want. And in particular, um, if we have data that looks like this, which is you know, a famous example of heteroskedacity, um, uh, we might want to, uh, not the standard least squares regression assumes that the variance is the same uh, independent. And we really might want to have something that more gives us a sense of, of uh, how uncertain we are at each, uh, it depends on X as well. So um, let's let F of, of Y given X be the cumulative distribution function of Y at X. So if we consider like X equals 50, we're getting some probability distribution here and we can look at its CDF, right? Then the inverse CDF takes a quantile Q as input and returns the, the value of Y that has that uh, cumulative probability, right? And so um, I'm showing the, and this is, this we can formulate this as a regression problem to, to model this F inverse of Q given X. Uh, so this is F inverse of Q for 0.1 as a function of X. 0.2 and so on. These are nine different quantile regression lines. And a common one uh, that people often do is median regression, right? Let's predict the median or the 0.5 quantile all along here. And uh, that looks very much like trying to minimize the absolute value of the error instead of the square of the, of the, of the prediction error. Um, and then, uh, in fact, it looks exactly like that <laughs> and, and because the absolute value elicits the median rather than the mean. But you can modify the absolute value loss to use what to create what's called the pinball loss, which is kind of a um, a, uh, a tweaked version of the absolute value with different different angles that will give you the 90th uh, quantile or the 10th quantile or whatever. And so there is a whole sub uh, uh, body of work on quantile regression, and uh, I like the quantile uh, regression forests that uh, Meinshausen published in 2006. And we're going to use that to calculate the delta over two and one minus delta over two quantiles. So we might say like the 0.1 and the 0.9 quantiles if, if delta was, was 0.2. Okay, so um, the problem with quantile regression though is it, it most quantile regression methods do not give you a guarantee. It, they don't produce a confidence interval. They're just producing a, a you know, a regression uh, uh, function. So in a really wonderful paper from uh, NeurIPS 2019, uh, Emmanuel Candes and two of his collaborators, Romano and Patterson, um, published a, a, a paper on how to use conformal prediction to conformalize quantile regression. Hmm. And the idea is basically to compute the error, uh, in quotes, between the observed values uh, y sub i and the predicted quantile, uh, uh, the quantile q and then conformalize those to get a correction. So imagine we're just thinking about this blue line here. This was the conform, uh, the uh, quantile regression line. And, uh, and we can look at uh, like this point right here and say, well, it's outside of that quantile regression line by some amount. We'll call that amount C sub i. So we'll take for each, um, so I should be getting ahead of myself. Again, we're going to assume that we divide the data into two sets. And the first data set, D1, we're going to use for fitting this quantile regression. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to hold that fixed. And now we're going to use the rest of our data, D2, to calculate these errors or, or, or uh, 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 discrepancies or whatever between the quantile prediction and the, the individual points, right? And so that, though, that discrepancy will be positive for these points that are above the line and negative for all these points that are below the line. Right, and then what we can do is uh, we can apply the conformalization trick. We can uh, we can collect all of these ci values for all of the all the different xi's, right, um, and then sort them into ascending order and return as our upper bound this um, this this uh, correction. So we have the quantile function, um, and then um, this uh, this correction to it. And one thing that's kind of nice about this is uh, if, if the quantile uh, prediction is actually too high, then um, this correction will be negative and will actually pull it down. Uh, if it's too low, it'll raise it up. And so in this case, uh, I just you know made this up, but we'll say that red dot dashed line 
is the corrected uh, uh, distribution. And so now, uh, and so so the the course the the claim we need to to verify uh, to get a guarantee is that these C values are exchangeable. And the argument for that is that uh, once we have computed the quantile function and holding it fixed, then these these departures, uh, you know, don't depend on the order in which the data were generated. They they all are uh, they are exchangeable. So so then we can give this guarantee that with probability one minus delta y will be less than or equal to its uh, its upper bound value. But the key thing is that this one minus delta guarantee is global, right? This comp this correction was computed over all possible values of, of i or xi, um, not at a specific query point. So while the value of the blue curve depends on the value of x, the size of this correction is a global correction. Um, and a consequence of that could be there might be some region in the X space, I don't know, maybe right around here, where we systematically are making lots of mistakes, right? And we get a lot of points outside the bound. And um, as long as that's only a fraction delta of all the possible X values, then we still have this one minus delta guarantee. And so you can't quite say, oh, given that X equals 50, I have with probability one minus delta, I'm going to be less than this red dashed line. All you can say is that uh, on average over all values of x, I, the, the, the red, uh, I, I will, uh, one minus delta of the time, I'll be below the red, uh, the red line. Um, and uh, in a subsequent paper, uh, I think Candace uh, and maybe Larry Wasserman was involved too, um, they prove of some impossibility results that you can't get what you want. <laughs> um, you can't get a point-wise individual prediction that gives you uh, confidence unless you have a whole bunch of samples of points exactly at x equals 50. But, uh, but if we assume that no two values of x are equal, you cannot get uh, a, a conditional uh, guarantee. You just can get a guarantee over maybe subregions of the space or, or globally over the whole space, but you can't get the point-wise guarantee that we really would like to have. So that's why it's semi-conditional. It's conditioned, the blue line is conditioned on X, but the, the, div, the correction is not. So any questions on that? Um, give people a chance to see if they want to post one. I had one just about, there was another question about a previous part. Um, at some point you had to merge the two D1s and D2s to make sure they maintained exchangeability. Right. Well, I'm just going to assume that I've, I've drawn them all exchangeably and then I just arbitrarily partition them into D1 and D2. Um, okay, so you sample them initially, it, it does that. Right. I'm, I'm, I, it, in some sense, this is, uh, this is kind of like, uh, I don't know, uh, calibration or cross-validation kind of thing, right? I fit my model using D1 and then I'm going to calibrate it using D2. Um, Actually, the yeah, the important thing is D2 needs to be exchangeable. D1 could have been more arbitrary, right? It's just, uh, it'll be better if it's a representative sample, but whatever F inverse of X happens to be, um, the this, this statement will still be valid as long as the samples in D2 are exchangeable. Um, so they might, in fact, even have been drawn from a different distribution. Um, okay. Somebody's so comment. Only distribution free. Negative Does results. Um, well, this is a distribution free result. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, there was a previous question about uh, the, I guess, the previous topic about the fitting the hyper rectangles. Like, is there a reason it has to be that? Um, could there be better coverage, like more optimal coverage with a different? volume like disconnected oh, well, shapes yes yeah, so so uh i mean because i'm interested in these trajectories over time the dimensions are is the time dimension i think that it makes sense that we're looking for hyper rectangles for that particular application right, but, so uh, but, if we, but if we knew we we had something that was more like ellipsoidal data you could actually conformalize the radius of this uh mahalanobis distance and get uh, a, a confidence interval over the multivariate Gaussian using conformal techniques uh, instead of typical asymptotic techniques. Um, 
So, okay, but then you would have an ellipsoid. And then you would have an ellipsoid, which would be yeah. a definitely a tighter interval. I mean, you can see sure. here that a axis parallel rectangle is not nearly as no, tight yeah. as the ellipsoid. I guess they're asking is like, yeah. could you have other shapes that are kind of wiggle around it a little bit, but they're not as tight as the ellipsoid. But I guess anything in between is possible. It's just how would you define that? Right. Right, but to conformalize, I somehow have to get it down to a single parameter that I'm estimating, uh, right? Because I, I need to be able to sort the data by that uh, parameter. In this case, it would be R. Uh, in, mm -hmm. in my case, it's beta. Uh, but, uh, but, but if you had some other shape, if you could somehow characterize its, its size by a single real parameter, then you could conformalize that too. Yeah. Right, and so another person's commenting then about like, Subsampling from different subregions of the data, and I guess that could apply to either of the, the two things you talked about. Right. So, so yeah, if we come back to here, right. So we could um, imagine that we like take all the data points from zero to fifty and come up with one conformal correction for them. I guess maybe this is a better picture. All the data points from zero to fifty and come up with one conformal adjustment for them, and all the points greater than fifty and come up with a different conformal adjustment right. for them. And we can see on this data that would in fact be uh, good. Right, because this adjustment would be smaller down in this part. Uh, hmm. Just ag again, um, yeah, uh, because there is variance along here <laughs> that's changing. Hmm. Uh, so uh, yeah, and in fact, um, uh, uh, there's another paper that was published recently, also I think by Emmanuel Candes and, and collaborators, where they talk about uh, that that is a sort of intermediate step. You can't get down to a point-wise guarantee, but you can get down to a region-wise guarantee. And now in each of those regions, uh, we would want to say maybe give a one minus delta over two guarantee that um, that that uh, points in this region would be uh, less than their bound, and points in this region would be less than their corrected bound. Right. And, and that might be better. I mean, it's still possible that your particular query point is in the loser set of these the the deltas that actually are the ones that break. Um, so. Yeah. Okay. okay. Well, back to our trajectory. So, so, um, so, how are we going to? So, so the idea for now to do things along trajectories is to extend conformalized quantile regression to multiple dimensions. So, we're going to put together these two ideas of conform of quantile regression and this multi-dimensional uh, confidence interval technique. And so, to do this, we're now going to need to divide our data into three sets. Um, the first set of behavior vectors we'll use and we'll do quantile regression on them. Then we're going to have a small, say, 100 uh, data points um, uh, trajectories that we're going to use to calculate the, uh, the uh, variance at each time t along the trajectory. And then the third set is going to be our uh, behavior vectors that we need uh, that we'll do the quantile, um, uh, the, the conformal correction on. So, um, uh, so we're stacking up some complexity here. So the plan is that first we'll use D1 and we'll fit these um, uh, uh, quantile regression functions. They are a function of time and the starting state, right? And then this will be the lower bound, and this is time and the starting state, and this will be the upper bound. Uh, and we'll fit these, I fit them separately for each time step T. Uh, you, you could also try to fit a single model. So when we use neural network quantile regression, we try to fit a single network that works for all starting states and all times t um, and outputs the two quantiles. And then what we're going to do is compute exceedances. And these are the amount by which each trajectory goes outside the quantile regression prediction. And we're going to calculate the maximum of those exceedances and then uh, calculate their variance, their standard deviation, um, and then use that to standardize the exceedances and then do the conformal confidence intervals on them. So let's go through that a lot more slowly. So imagine that I have a, you know, I have a particular starting state, S0, and I uh, can, can uh, evaluate the, um, uh, the, the quantile regressions, and I get this black dotted line is the quantile regression lower bound as a function of time. And the upper one is the uh, is its upper bound as a function of time. So that's for the one minus delta over two, right? Um, and uh, and then I have the actual trajectory. And it turns out this actual trajectory went outside of the uh, quantile regression bounds. And so we're going to call this amount here x i t 
the exceedance uh, of trajectory i, this red uh, behavior vector i, at time t uh, right there. So that's the exceedance. So if a trajectory stays entirely inside the bounds, then all of its xit values will be zero. Uh, and if it goes outside either above or below the bounds, then it'll have a positive uh, amount that it's exceeded the, the bounds by. Um, so now that's going to give us these, um, these xits. Uh, these, uh, and so now, uh, now we're going to basically follow the scaled SD uh, interval uh, strategy that I first introduced. We'll compute the, the standard deviation along each time step and then use that to rescale these exceedances so that they're all on the same standardized scale. Then we compute the maximum uh, departure um, right, uh, the, the maximum uh, uh, standardized uh, exceedance outside of the bounds, compute their order statistics, and then let uh, beta, the scaling factor, be the um, 1 minus delta n plus 1 divided by n quantile of these c values. So then we can get another uh, theorem which says, again, with respect to the randomness in the starting state distribution and any stochasticity that happens in the policy or the world um, that the the behavior vector of the of a query b star for a query trajectory tau star will fall within the bounds uh, with probability one minus delta so um yeah so that so that's the the main results in in the in this uh, in the paper um uh, but now we have to talk about theory and practice. <laughs> um, so uh, in theory, this, this, uh, when we compute this uh, estimate of the, of the quantile, um, it's unbiased, and, 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 but, but unfortunately, uh, it, it, uh, it, it tends to balance um, being too large with being too small. Um, and, uh, and for safety purposes, we would really like it to, to never be too small. We want it to really be the true quantile, right, in order to, to um, uh, really trust the guarantee. So for example, here, I took uh, uh, a, a varying size of samples from, again, a T distribution with one degree of freedom and looked at uh, what we call the strict estimation error. So we call this the strict quantile estimator. Uh, strict estimation error for the 90th quantile, and we can see that uh, you know it it is unbiased and it, it converges to to zero, um, but uh, but the median is a little less than zero, and there's quite a lot of negative uh, right half the time the quantile estimate is too small, well, more than half the time here. Eventually, about half the time it's too small, uh, and and so what we found in practice is that uh, until your sample size gets pretty big. Um, it, it's, uh, it's a little risky to trust this quantile estimate. So despite the theorems, uh, in reality, what we can do is instead use a confidence interval on the quantile, an upper confidence estimate on the quantile. So what I do is uh, there's work on, on getting confidence intervals on quantile estimators, of course, uh, and, and I use a technique that was published by Nyblom in 1992. Um, and, uh, and these are plots as a function of the size of the sample. What's the probability that the quantile estimate is greater than or equal to the true value? And therefore would give us a, uh, a, you know, a, a, a safe guarantee. And the black lines are for the strict way of calculating it. And these blue lines are using Nyblom's upper bound. And so this is when we're trying to achieve 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.95, 0 0.99. And we can see uh, that that in general the strict method, you know, is, uh, converges toward 0.5 from below, um, whereas this uh, using the upper bound works uh, well. Except, ooh, out here when we're trying to get the 99th quantile, you still need a, a big enough sample, so it even it fails even uh, even down here. Um, so uh, so I'd say the that's the biggest weakness of this strategy is that you need a significant amount of data. Um, and we'll see that uh, significant might be 500 samples uh, or more for the quantile uh, uh, pro uh, process. So by this time, by the conformalization process. So by this time in the talk, you, you're, you're, we're just like overwhelmed with quantiles. Um, 
So, you know, we're doing the quantile regression. Then for conformalization, we need to estimate this one minus delta n plus one over n quantile. And now I just introduced a third upper confidence band um, uh, on top of things. So um, uh, hopefully uh, this clarifies it a little bit. OK, well, let's look at the results. Um, so, so the first problem we studied was uh, Tamarisk invasions in river networks. And, uh, and I think, Mark, when you were here, we had already started working on this, right? But, uh, but I've continued to collaborate with uh, uh, Joe Albers, who's a professor now at the University of Wyoming. Um, but but uh, over the years, uh, she had a student, Kim uh, Meyer Hall, who uh, did her PhD thesis on uh, economic analysis of Tamarisk invasions. And, uh, and my student, Majid Alki Talagan, worked on uh, 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 reinforcement learning algorithms pack with uh, PAC guarantees for um, solving these problems, particularly in their risk sensitive formulation. So uh, this is a somewhat stylized model of reality, the, the kind the economists like to use. But let's imagine we have a river network that, that, uh, that has seven uh, different um, edges in its, in its graph. So we think of this as water flowing along this and then two streams merge to form a larger stream and merges with another one and then flows out, say, you know, into Lake Ontario or something. And, um, and, and these, uh, these, this river network has very short, uh, what are called reaches, um, because they're only big enough to hold one plant. <laughs> In, it's either a tamarisk tree, which is labeled as I for invader, or a native tree, um, maybe a maple, uh, that will label as N for native. And then some reaches might not have anything growing on them. Those are empty. Um, and so uh, the dynamics of this at each time step is that um, uh, time steps are actually years in this, in this problem. Um, in each year, uh, some trees die a natural death. Um, and so uh, a, a, an edge that's occupied can go to empty. But then among the trees that are still alive, they produce seeds, uh, some number of seeds. Um, and then uh, uh, those are basically drop into the river and can travel stochastically throughout the network, uh, you know, overwhelmingly downstream, right? But there is a probability distribution if a seed is released by this tamarisk tree here, um, it has some probability of, of, of propagating to here or, or of propagating down to here, and even a minuscule probability of propagating upstream. Um, that might be assisted by a bird or a frog or something, uh, or a fisherman. Um, so, um, uh, and so then the, the, um, the goal of, um, of a management policy here is uh, it, we have four actions we can do at each year on each edge. So one thing we can do is go to an empty edge and plant a native plant there, and that will succeed in, in growing with some probability. We can also go to an invaded edge and just kill the tamarisk tree that's there, and that will succeed with some probability. Or we can uh, not only try to kill the tamarisk, but also try to plant a tree. That's more expensive. And then, of course, we can do nothing, which is uh, doesn't cost anything. Um, and uh, so it would seem like in one time step, you could just go in and kill all the tamarisks and plant natives everywhere and you'd be done with high probability. But of course, in real river networks, there could be hundreds of these trees along each edge of the river and, uh, and you just don't have a budget that allows you to do that. So we model that budget restriction here as pretty much um, restricting us to just one action in an edge per year, um, which makes the problem uh, much more challenging and more realistic, despite all of the approximations. Okay, so, so here's examples of the kinds of perspective intervals that we can give and then their actual trajectories. So this is a trajectory that starts in a state where there are four empty uh, uh, slots, two native uh, trees and one tamarisk tree. And it turns out that we basically can kill that tamarisk tree in one time step and then life is good. So this is the, the cumulative reward. And as I mentioned, all the rewards are negative because they're actually costs but we only incur a cost in the first time step and then things are good. And these and the black lines are the, are the confidence bounds. Um, and then uh, here's a uh, starting state where there are three tamarisk trees and three empty slots. So it's a much more risky situation, right? Because we can only kill one tamarisk per time step and that gives the tamarisk a chance to spread their seeds. 
Um, but it turns out that uh, the, the policy still, um, in the worst case, we think, well, that uh, I think, oh, I didn't write down. I think this is uh, the uh, Delta's point two. So this is an 80% guarantee, these limits, um, uh, that, that even in the worst case, it's only gonna cost us about 40 units to bring this uh, invasion under control, according to this. And then, uh, and here's a case that was even more grim uh, there are no natives at all, two empty slots, and everything else is tamarisk. And um, the, uh, the the confidence bounds are wide and, and, and negative, but it turned out reality was even worse. We get really unlucky in this case. And um, even when we uh, uh, plant some natives, they die <laughs> spontaneously, and uh, tamarisks are able to spread their seeds. Um, and so in, in one case, we have to kill a tamarisk three times in the same uh, location before uh, we finally kill them off. And so this exceeds our bounds by, by quite a lot. So this is a, uh, an example of a failure, uh, statistically. Um, you could also, th this also points out that it might be very useful not to just visualize the cumulative uh, cost of management, but also like how many tamarisks do you have to kill or how many tamarisks are alive at each time step. Uh, might be other interesting visualizations. Okay, well, um, to to evaluate the cover of, uh, to evaluate confidence intervals, you really want to check whether their claimed coverage um, matches the their their uh, coverage experimentally. Um, and so uh, this is a fairly busy plot, but what I'm plotting is the um, probability of a trajectory being covered by the interval, and uh, and it's grouped into these four groups. So over here we have um, uh, delta equals 0.2. So we want that 80% of the trajectories are covered by the confidence interval, 90%, 95%, and 99%. And then um, there are four different sample sizes here. This is for the size of, of, the, um, of, of D3, I guess, the, 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 the size of the data we're using to, calc to do the conformal uh, fix. And then there are three different colors of bars. So the gray bars are if we just use the, the intervals we get from quantile regression. Um, and the blue bars are if we use the strict method of calculating the, the uh, quantiles, and the green bars are if we use my uh, confidence interval way of calculating the, the quantiles for the bound. And in this case, despite the fact that Tamarisk is very stochastic, as you could see, um, uh, both the strict and the confidence interval uh, methods uh, succeed in all 16 configurations, whereas using the raw quantile regression fails in all 16 conditions, fails to achieve the target coverage. I mean, it's not terrible, right? But you can see that um, that that uh, if you just use quantile regression, you're not you're not getting 80% coverage, even though the quantiles are trying to predict uh, uh, 0.1 and 0.9 quantiles. Uh, so, just how big are the conformal corrections? Um, well, they can be pretty big. Uh, so, what I'm plotting here, and it's a little bit hard to see, but the Gray lines are the uh, width of the confidence interval, uh, width of the interval as a function of time step, right? And so they start out small, but then of course uncertainty grows as we go along the trajectory. And so this is for the 99 uh, percentile uh, guarantee. And then the corresponding green line uh, is the corrected thing. So in this case, the width's pretty much doubled to, to get to a 99% guarantee, right? Um, if we only want an 80% guarantee, then they don't double. We go from the, these gray dots to the green dots. And so it's a much smaller correction. Okay, and then in the second domain that we looked at was uh, uh, battles in StarCraft. So we just looked at the simple case where we have two sides, which we call red and blue, and uh, they have units of equal strength in terms of the capabilities of their units. Um, but the blue side starts with a number of units that is between five and 20 drawn uniformly at random. The red side only between five and 10 units also drawn uniformly at random. But the red side has the advantage that at time 14, reinforcements are going to arrive, but the amount of reinforcements is stochastic. Um, and, uh, and, and where the number of reinforcements is uniform between zero and N, where N itself is uniform between zero and 15 which gives us something that looks a, a bit like an exponential distribution. Um, uh, and so the idea is that, uh, you know, in the start, at, at the start, 
the blue team generally, uh, on average, is going to have a, a piece advantage and and a high chance of winning the game, except that uh, the learned policy should know that at time 14, things could get a lot worse uh, because there's a lot more stochasticity um, in, in what's going to happen. So here's the StarCraft coverages. And in this case, uh, the raw method actually does succeed. Um, uh, let's see, where does it succeed? It succeeds up here. Um, oh, I should mention these little red error bars here are uh, uh, due to the fact that um, I'm using 5,000 uh, test trajectories to evaluate uh, this coverage. But even with 5,000, there is some uncertainty about the true coverage. Uh, so this is a 99% upper bound on the uh, on the true coverage um, is the top of that little red confidence interval. So anyway, I guess uh, maybe the, the baseline method succeeds here and here or something like that in two of the cases without any conformal correction. The strict method only succeeds in five of the 16 configurations and the confidence interval uh, approach um, to, to estimating the quantile it succeeds in 14 out of the 16 configurations. So we can see in particular, we don't do well here with these smaller samples, right? As my uh, previous uh, experiment showed, you need quite a lot of data if you're going to try to get such a tight guarantee, uh, a 99% guarantee. And the, the intervals are not widened as much because the StarCraft problem is not as random uh, uh, as, the, as the Tamarisk problem. Okay, well, um, I think we're running out of time, so I'm going to skip this bit and, uh, and, and conclude here. So it's been a complicated journey. We started by talking about conformal uh, confidence intervals for, a, for just a single variable. And then the first uh, idea in the paper is, is to get conformal confidence intervals over d-dimensional data. And the idea is to scale each dimension uh, just by its uh, standard deviation so that we can convert it into just estimating this one parameter beta, and then we can use conformal methods to, to get a guarantee. Uh, then we turned our attention to trajectory-wise confidence intervals, and there we brought in this idea of using a um, quantile regression method to get an initial prediction interval that is conditional, and then we use conformal methods to adjust that to, to get a, a, a semi, uh, conditional guarantee. And we see that they give very good performance on the two MDPs. I mean, even in the case where they uh, don't quite succeed, they come close. Um, as long as you, and, and the key thing is you do need, uh, say, at least 500 trajectories in the, in the, in the um, StarCraft case. Um, and I didn't talk about it, but, uh, but we can, if some people want to ask about it, I also lo looked at a, an alternative, which is based on total exceedance. Um, as another way of trying to visualize this. So um, uh, I guess to assess the method, the guarantees are semi-conditional. As I've tried to stress, the quantile regressions are conditioned on the actual starting state you're using, but the conformal corrections that give you the guarantee are, are with respect to the uh, entire uh, starting state distribution, not just as not. So they are unconditional. Uh, now, if the if the failures where the where the, the the trajectories that violate the condition if they are scattered throughout the state space, then this isn't a serious issue, I don't think. But if the failures are all concentrated in one region, then the claim that you're giving a guarantee uh, is misleading because that 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 guarantee might not apply at all in state S not if S not is in one of these bad regions. So that would be an important thing to to detect and and if you do have a real concentration of of problems then you really should partition the space and fit separate uh, conformal uh, corrections in those regions as we discussed okay so um, I guess I'll thank my funders and uh, and thank my collaborators so um, Kiri Wagstaff who's uh, working with me now and and a former student C Liu uh, gave me detailed feedback on the work and then of course this is, it grows out of a collaboration with Kim Majid and, and, and Heidi uh, Joe Albers. And I'll leave this up for while we answer questions. Great, we have uh, applause. Let's see here from the crowd. 
Um, one of the drawbacks <laughs> of not being able to see the audience, you don't know. Um, great, so yeah, if anyone has um, more questions, you can post it into the, the live Q&A. And I don't know if Tom, if you can open the window. Maybe I should get out of this full screen mode and then I can look at it. Then you may be able to see it, yeah. So they can see it more directly rather than me reading to you. Um, there was a, a question while you were on the last part saying that um, for your conformal uh, CI method, I think, um, even that strict method is not a real guarantee for safety concerns since um, you still have the probability for the, the delta probability of failure. Okay, let's see. Good. Publish, dismiss. Um, I'm trying to figure out the user interface. Sure. Okay. Um, why have a rectangles, negative result? Uh, could you use sampling techniques? Um, yeah, so the, right, I mean, that's why I, yeah, why I'm trying to augment the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the strict method using the, using confidence intervals on the, to get a better estimate of the quantile. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I mean, the theorem is a theorem, and so the question is, why is it breaking down here? Um, uh, and and I guess I don't have a full understanding of that. Um, and uh, yeah, and maybe maybe uh, I'm going to talk to Shai later today. Maybe we can uh, put our heads together and think about that a bit more. Um, but I think uh, still, if I can get like a 90% guarantee that the real behavior is going to be within these bounds, that uh, uh, gives me that's better than just. Um, uh, than than just uh, just uh, calculating uh, just giving a visualization and saying well this is kind of what might happen um, in previous work uh, I had a student Sean McGregor right who did exactly that so we would collect um, say a hundred trajectories from a problem and then we would just plot them as a sort of cloud of trajectories and say this is uh, this is roughly how the thing's going to behave um, and that's a very natural visualization but it's nice to be able to give uh, uh, confidence intervals that, that have some uh, some meaning behind them, I think. Let's see, I can't hear I was muted. Oh. Yeah, I was muted there for a second. Um, so I don't see any other questions yet. If people want to post one up, um, they can. Uh, I don't know, this sensitivity to start state seems important and hard to to solve, like if there's a pattern in the data that is relevant, you have to pre-cluster and divide it. Somehow. Yeah, so yeah, like I mean, I would practice. think that, right that that uh, when I fit my quantile regressions, I could also look at my residuals there, right? I mean, this would this would be always good practice, right? To look at my residuals and see uh, because they if the quantile if the fitted quantile regression function is uh, is a is a good fit then you would like that its residuals should be, um, you know, kind of uh, IID and scattered around and not, not concentrated in one region. Um, so uh, you could definitely look at them. And if you saw that scattering, then um, that might success suggest either actually changing the quantile regression uh, to be more expressive and somehow be able to capture that. You know, I was using in that, in the, that example, just using linear models, but, but of course, uh, we're using either quantile regression forests, which are very flexible, or neural network uh, regre uh, quantile regressions. Um, so uh, yeah, so if you can get your quantile regression to fit well, then then the then your residuals uh, or or departures um, should look more like they are uh, homoscedastic and so right. Or they're, they're, they're they're homogeneous across the space, and if they're homogeneous across the space, then I think the 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 method is is uh, is giving a, a fair uh, predict, uh, picture of what's going to happen. If they aren't homogeneous, then yeah, then we either need to partition the space somehow or use a better quantile regression model, uh, something like that. Right, yeah. that makes sense. Um, and then I guess you said you had something else to say about this total exceedancy. Is that like, oh yeah, just look at so, all the points. So one question there is, um, I mean, I could actually bring up the slides again, I guess. Um, is, uh, seeing that? No, you're not seeing that. Yep, I can see it now. 
Okay. I'm not it's sure. not full screen, but I can see it. Oh, okay. It didn't go to full screen. Yeah, I tried no, to. No, you I see the menu. It the full screen, but it sort of rejected me. Okay, okay. so one question is, um, you know, an alternative to doing the corrections is, I guess, maybe if we go, uh, um, well, yeah, let's let's go way back to, to here. So, um, uh, yeah, I really do need to go to full screen in a second. Let's uh, so why don't I let me do that. Make it work more escape. Uh, how do I get out of full screen mode? Oh, maybe with this thing. Okay, let's put this into the now back to the camera. I'm having fun here. Hang on a second. <laughs> okay. Now I think I'm in the configuration I want. Um, but what I wanted to do was go back to about slide five four. Okay. Yeah, so so one, you know, what I'm doing is basically trying to correct these uh, the uh, quantile regressions, and we get these green, you know, expanded bounds. But an alternative would be just to output this, and then say to the to the uh, user, um, okay, uh, uh, here it's it's going to look kind of like this, and then I'm going to tell you that the uh, total amount by which it, the trajectory will go outside the bounds will be ten. Or something like that, right? So I could say that uh, uh, instead of I could just give the total exceedances over the whole thing. So, or if we come down later, where was that? About uh, maybe um, this picture here, right? So, so we could add up all of the uh, exceedances along uh, the trajectory, uh, and we'll get some total amount by which the uh, red trajectory falls outside of the quantile regression bounds, and then we could just um, Conformalize that, um, and so we did that, um, and uh, and and then I and so you the I guess it, you know it works, and so you get good coverages. Um, but uh, but for um, Starcraft, it looks something like this: like if you want a um, twenty percent guarantee or a ten percent or even a five percent guarantee, um, the method says, well, it'll be inside the quantile regression bounds. Uh, except uh, no more than two steps outside, two two units of, of reward outside those bounds. Um, or in this case, I guess three steps, and here it's bad. But then, unfortunately, if you want to get a 99% <laughs> uh, percent guarantee, then, well, then uh, I have to say it's it's limited these bounds, but it might be as bad as 46 steps outside the bounds, right? And, um, and with uh, Tamarisk, it's even worse. Um, the, the vertical axis is now on a log scale. And so I can say, well, it'll be inside the bounds. Um, and this is for an 80% guarantee over here. Um, uh, but, uh, but maybe, um, uh, but, but the total cost might be as much as 10, but it could be <laughs> uh, for a 95% guarantee, 100, or for a 99% you know, guarantee, we're up in the six or seven hundreds or even thousands uh, of cost units. So um, I think you could argue that if the total exceedance is going to be small, just one or two units, uh, as in the StarCraft case, then just showing people the, the quantile regression um, and then saying, but, but, uh, but the total exceedance might be outside that by, by two or three values. That's, that's still a, a, a faithful depiction of the future. Whereas if I'm saying, you know, well, you know, it's within these bounds that, that are between zero and 80, but it might be a thousand uh, units outside. That, that's uh, no longer a very um, faithful depiction of, the, of what the future is going to be like. Um, right, yeah, if you've got that, that delta probability and then the way it deviates is enormous, then you don't want to be showing that. Right. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so I think there's no more questions. Um, so uh, I guess we'll uh, thank you again uh, for the fantastic okay. talk. Um, go on in depth onto that and uh, welcome you for, for coming to visit. And I think you have visits on, on campus with the rest of some of the people, but um, hopefully soon in the future we'll be able to invite you here in person um, for something where we can see people in person. Right.
Yeah, I would look forward to that. But in any case, uh, thank you for the questions and I look forward to the rest of the day. So, okay. See you all later.